You're listening to Sent, a sermon series that walks through the Gospel of John, focusing on John's call for us to live sent, being a people fashioned in the image of God. For more information about First Baptist Startville, you can visit www.fbcstartville.com. It's one thing to pray to God. It's another thing to have God pray for you. And in the Bible, it gives us not only the Lord's prayer, but it also shows us the Lord praying for us. And Jesus praying for us means the greatest comfort that we could ever imagine. Now, if we're honest and we think Jesus praying for us, it brings a lot of questions to our mind. If Jesus is fully God, for example, what does it mean for him to pray for us? And really, if we ask those questions, those types of questions, they pull us in to Jesus. And Jesus is our mediator. And what's a mediator? A mediator is one who stands in our place, one who speaks on our behalf. And really, the ministry of a mediator is necessary when there's been a conflict. It's especially necessary when there's a conflict. And so when two parties are at odds, a mediator is needed as a go-between to resolve whatever conflict there is. And the Bible tells us the truth. And here's the truth. Things were not okay between us and God. And someone was needed to go between you and God. And Jesus is that go-between. You see, here's the beauty of Christianity. Our mediator is none other than God himself. He mediates for us as us, not standing above us or in front of us, but as one of us. He unites us with himself. He stands accused, and he pays the penalty for our sin so that we can be reconciled to him forever. You see, Jesus is the union of God and man. And as one theologian said, God comes in his love and binds us to himself forever. You see, something entirely unique happened when Jesus came. And Jesus' coming is really the basis of all of our hope. And so when we see Jesus praying, we see him doing exactly what he was intending to do, mediate for us. You see, this is his mission as the sent son. He is sent for us. He was sent so that, as Thomas Torrance says, he can expose us to God and bind us to him as never before in a bond of forgiveness and reconciliation. So we could say that the whole life of Jesus is his prayer. He offers his whole life to God for us so that he can give us salvation. And we understand this because we know Jesus, listen, as the sent Son. And this one word, sent, is the word that John is using for us to show us Jesus. Sent, remember, means salvation. And so let's take our Bibles and and let's turn today to John chapter 17. And in John 17, verse 20 through 26, we're going to see Jesus praying for us as he faces the cross. Listen to the word of the Lord. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. 
Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you've given me before you love me, before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Did you hear Jesus pray for you? That's exactly what we have in John 17. You, as the Bible just told us, are those who believe in me through their word. That's us. When Jesus uses that language in John 17, he's talking about me. He's talking about you. You see, all of us who believe in Jesus believe because somebody told us. But see, here's the beauty. They didn't just tell us. They showed us. At school, we used to have uh, show and tell. I don't know if you remember show and tell, but we had show and tell. And one of my friends said that he had a lizard. I remember this. Uh, and none of us believed that he had a lizard. That is, we thought that his mama wouldn't allow him to have a lizard. That is, until show and tell came on Friday. And guess what? He showed up with a lizard. When we saw that he had a lizard, <laughs> we believed though there were still some that really doubted that it was really his to begin with. And they said that it wasn't his lizard, but someone else's lizard. And it's amazing as we think about how some things just never change. But what did the disciples do to show the difference that Jesus made in the world? They didn't just tell, they showed. What did they, what did they do to show the difference that Jesus made in the world? They loved one another. That's what they did. They loved one another. In John chapter 13, if we were to take our Bibles and skip back a few pages, in John chapter 13, right after Jesus, right after he takes a towel and basin, right after he washes the disciples' feet, even the one who was going to betray him, even Judas, this is what he says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I've loved you. You also are to love one another. Do you hear this correspondence? Just as, so I, so you. And then he says this, By this, all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. So as our passage tells us today, we are sent to show love. And if that's true, then what can we learn from this passage in John 17, 20 through 26? How can we show love? Well, let's start at verse 20. Verse 20 tells us that we show love by first delivering life-giving words. We deliver life-giving words. And so we then are those who have responded to the message of the apostles. We believe the word of the apostles. And some of you say, well, where is the word of the apostles? And the answer to that question is, is the Bible. Remember the story of the Bible is Jesus according to the Scripture. Jesus according to Scripture. That is, Jesus is according to the message of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus himself, the cornerstone, as Paul told a church in Ephesians. So what's the message of the Bible then? If that's what we've come to believe, then what's the message of the Bible? Well, John tells us in John 17. Listen carefully. This is eternal life, that they know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. That's eternal life, knowing God and His Son whom He sent. And so in other words, we have a word that saves. It's a word that has been given to us, and it goes something like this. Listen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Whosoever believes in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He who believes in him, though they die, will live. And the one who believes in him will never die. And here's our response. Do you believe this? You see, it's this word that's come to you today. And I want to ask you, 
do you believe this word? You see, we didn't make up this word. This word comes to us. It came to us. And now it's come to you. And the question that you have to answer, that nobody can answer for you, the pastor can't answer for you, your Sunday school teacher can't answer for you, your mom, grandmom, granddad, dad, do you believe this? If you believe this, the Bible says you will have everlasting life. You see, remember this, it's, it's not enough for you to simply say that you believe. I had an uncle who was in law enforcement for three or four decades, uh, climbed very high in ranks. He was a chief at one time, and he used to tell me, Andy, you can make your mouth say anything. So it's not enough for you to just simply say that you believe. The Bible says believe in the Lord, not just simply believe about the Lord. There's so many that you probably know, and hopefully you aren't one of these, but there's so many who they believe about the Lord, but they don't believe in Him. That is, there are few who base their whole life on what Jesus Christ says. So how can we know if we truly believe? Well, Jesus spells it out in this passage in verse 21. He says that they may all be one. And so one of the ways that we know that we believe in Jesus is we love. And notice this correspondence at verse 21. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So there's something about Jesus. There's something about our message that makes us one. And we're one because he who saved us is one. There's a family resemblance now that we're adopted into. Our God is Father, Spirit, and Son, dwelling together in unity, and then He invites us through grace, amazing grace, into that unity. And so the basis for our unity is, is Him, not us. But there's a purpose for our unity, and that purpose is further at verse 21. Look at what it says. So that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, we show love by, secondly, uniting together for the sake of others. I don't have to convince you of this, hopefully not too much, but there's a whole world that needs to know what you know. There's a world that needs to hear this message, this message of salvation in Christ alone. And you see, what we know, that saving knowledge that we have, what we know is experienced. It's not just wishful thinking. You see, the Christian faith is not just pie in the sky, by and by. It's better than that. Our faith has hands, legs, and, and feet. And the way that others are able to see Jesus is through us. The way that others are able to see Jesus is through you. The Bible speaks of the church, and listen to this language. The Bible calls the church the body of Christ. And it does that for a reason. You remember Lazarus? Lazarus, when, when he was dead, you remember how the crowds knew that Jesus loved him so much? Do you remember? How did they know that Jesus loved Lazarus? They saw Jesus weeping. The crowds know that there's a God who offers hope and forgiveness because we love each other. We are those people that dwell together in unity. We are, we are quick to put up with each other. We're quick to remind each other of hope. We're quick to forgive each other because that's what God has done for us in Christ. You know, just over the past few years in particular, it, it seems to me as the more I live as a pastor, the more I just realize that we are far from Jesus' vision in John 17. And here's the reason I think we're so far away from it, because we've been lulled to sleep by a southern fried version of Christianity that's more cultural than it is Christian. You see, for far too long, we've been able to get away with lazy Christian Christian thinking that just assumes the truth instead of defends and defines the truth. 
And we have so many challenges that are coming our way that are seeking to disrupt our Christian confession, that is seeking to disrupt our this vision that Jesus has for Christian unity. And those challenges that are coming our way are, are so new to us. But I want to assure you of this. Our faith has been here before. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And so listen, these times are very challenging, yes, but they're challenging, but they're not unprecedented. And I believe providentially the Lord is taking these moments to force us out of our Christian barracks, to force us out of our holy huddles, to the front lines of spiritual warfare where there's a real enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. In our community, there are so many that are lost and unsaved. In your community where you're watching this, there are so many that are lost and unsaved. And we have a word from God to them. And you say, what's the message? The message is that you are more flawed than you realize and you are more loved than you could ever imagine. And we say that to them because that's what God in Christ says to us. You see, there is a God in heaven who sent his son to give life, eternal life, to whosoever. And experience tells us, if we're honest, this is probably your own experience, if you're honest. Experience tells us that the world will listen to what we say. No one wants to be involved in a hopeless group. There's, there's enough tension in the world without having tension in church. There's enough division in the world without having to feel division in the church. And listen carefully to the way that I say this. We have an evangelistic reason to be united. And that reason is because there is an onlooking world who is desperate for hope and looking to see if what we say is true. Looking to see if the empty tomb of today that we celebrate is going to make any difference to the way we act and talk to each other tomorrow. Our world is desperate for hope, desperate for meaning, and God is calling us to unity so that they, pay attention to the language of our Lord, so that they may believe. In other words, we show them love by, number three, doing whatever it takes for others to know Jesus. We do whatever it takes for others to know Jesus. You see, John, he's going to write another letter to one of the churches later, and he's going to say, I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in truth. For parents out there, can you imagine a greater joy than to hear that your children are walking in truth? And for children out there, wouldn't you agree that your parents, they want you to walk in truth? You say, well, what is truth? Funny that you should ask because Jesus was asked that question once by a Roman governor named Pilate. And on that day when Pilate asked the question, Jesus didn't answer. You see, Jesus didn't need to answer because Pilate was looking into the face of the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, listen, Jesus is not some way or some truth or some way to the truth. No, the Bible is much more specific than that. It's richer than that. He himself is truth. And he was willing to die to demonstrate this truth. And what about you? What are you willing to do so that others can know this truth? What are you willing to stop doing so that others can know this truth? What are you willing to pick up and start doing so that others can know this truth? If it's true, it's the greatest 
news in the world. And if it's true, and it is true, it should change whatever we do because all of our life is marked by what we celebrate on this Easter. Jesus Christ is risen. Death is defeated. Sin is undone. We now have a permanent place with Him forever. What are you willing to do so that others may know this truth? You see, verse 22 of John 17 tells us that Jesus gave up His glory. Well, how did He give up His glory? He gave up His glory through the suffering of the cross. You see, the cross is that moment we sing about where we see Him clearly as He is, as the one who left His Father's throne above, so free, so infinite His grace, emptied Himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Is He worth knowing? Are we willing to do whatever it takes that others might know Him? Oh, this is such an important point, and, and I really pray that you're thinking through this right now. You see, when we remember that His glory is a glory that's given to us, a glory that invites us into His pre-existent unity, then it changes the way that we think about what we do. Because we're no longer working, we're no longer working towards that glory. We're working from that glory. In other words, we're working as others not to try to earn it, but those who've already received it. In other words, having the glory of God given through Christ, it frees us to have the attitude that says, we're going to do whatever it takes so that others know the message of redeeming love because this is what Jesus has done for us. He did whatever it took. And what did it take? He sent His only begotten Son to take my sin and your sin and the sin of the world upon His back to die a death He didn't deserve so that He could give us eternal life. There are so many things that are trying to pull our attention away from the glory that's already been given to us. But if we're thinking clearly, then we'll agree that we have a more pressing matter that unites us. And what is it that unites us? It's the message that we believe. It's a word of hope for the world, for whosoever has faith in Jesus Christ. How do we show love? We'll be more prone to show love by, number four, remembering that Jesus loves us. Remember that Jesus loves you. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 is so rich. Pay attention to the way that it's written. Jesus desires us to be with Him. That's the way that the verse is written. Now, it's one thing for us to desire to be with God, and I want to be there. But what makes it so rich for our confession that Jesus taught us is that God wants us to be with Him forever. I remember growing up, there was, there was always that neighborhood kid who would ring the doorbell and want to play. And, and he did this every day after school. He did this every day. And if I'm honest, we were friends, but we really weren't that good of friends. And so uh, there were some days that... Uh, my friend would ring the doorbell and I would, I would run the other way or lock the door or tell my mother that I wasn't here or whatever the case may be. But this is not what Jesus does for us. He is on a mission to take us where He is forever. And He wants us there. And He will never grow weary of our company and we'll never grow weary of His. You know why? Because He loves us. There is freedom that His love gives us. And you know what that freedom frees us to do? Love, just as we are loved. To be loving, just as we've been loved. Do you know how much He loves you? Well, I can't wait to tell you this. Do you know how much He loves you? 
He loves you so much that he was willing to die to give you life. He loves you so much that he was willing to defeat death and rise from the dead so that you could be with him forever. You say, how can we show love? Fifthly and finally, we can show love by joining Jesus on his mission. If we look at the close of the prayer, Jesus closes the prayer by focusing on his mission. Jesus says at the end of that prayer, he says, I made known to them your name, and I'll continue to make it known. In other words, the ministry of Jesus is ongoing. The ministry of Jesus continues, and you say, how? Through us. The ministry of Jesus continues through me and you. He has entrusted us with this message of salvation. We are those whom he has filled with his spirit, those whom he has bought with his blood, and then he sends out into the world. And all over the world, his mission is still advancing. All over the world, we're celebrating not a, not a dead religion, but a living Savior. We are celebrating, as an old preacher said, a king who the Pharisees couldn't stand, but they found out they couldn't stop. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That's what we're celebrating today. He is risen, and he has invited us to join with him on telling the world what we now know, what we can see. This Jesus who's alive, this Jesus who's changed me, this Jesus who can change you, and this Jesus who's coming again. And I want you to hear his voice today. It's this Jesus that calls us today to join him on mission, to tell the world that there is salvation, there is satisfaction, there is rest for a weary soul. We are sent to show love. And the most loving thing that we can do is tell this story and then show them the story by the way that we love each other and love those that the world regards as unlovable, unredeemable, unforgivable. Our message to them is that you can be redeemed, you can be forgiven, because you are loved. And you know why we're able to say that? Because we know that Jesus loves us. And Father, it's my prayer that everyone listening today would feel the warm embrace of your love and that you would remind them that you love them, that you accept them. And Father, please, for those that don't have a relationship with you, may today be the day that they find you. May today be the day that they accept your love. Father, help us to be a church. Help us to be a group of believers who love because we're loved. Help us for these things. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.